Hey everybody, happy Tuesday. It's Tuesday and it's time for Quilt Nerd. And you're here and I'm here. And I hope the sound sounds okay. I did a I did a sound check, but I I don't know. I didn't I didn't I did a sound check, but then I didn't totally check the check. It should be fine. Nothing nothing has really changed. But I always turn to Stephanie Cake to see if we're okay. She's given the all clear. Okay, good. Um, everybody, welcome. Yes. That's for you. Um, it's, yeah, it's Tuesday night and uh, I mean, I don't know, it's crazy. I, 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 uh, I was feeling one type of way uh, and then I got a phone call from a friend who's going through some stuff and so then my mood kind of changed, you know, because then I was really, you know, helping him out, thinking about the circumstance, you know, that he's finding himself in. Anyway. Um, and so, and so then I, I, I changed the intro quilt, you know, here on Quilt Nerd, um, we, we have a quilt that starts off the show and it's not that it sets the tone for the show. That's not, that's not what it's about. In fact, I like to have the intro quilt be very different from the rest of the show. Sometimes it kind of goes into something else, but, uh, you know, to the, to the first section or so, but, um, but not usually I like to have it be completely different. Um, and that, and that, and it is completely different tonight. Um, but anyway, I, I had something else planned and then I changed it. So we'll get to that quilt here in a minute. Um, but I was thinking about a, a couple different things this week, just a few thoughts and then we'll start. By the way, if you've never seen Quilt Nerd, um, this is a, a show about quilts. Uh, we don't teach you how to make them. We talk about them and we talk about quilt history and quilt culture. And quilt culture, what we mean by that is just um, the life of quilts in popular culture and um, and what they mean and what they say and who makes them and why they make them and um, yeah there's a lot of ways to make quilts a lot every all around the world people make quilts and a quilt is defined by um, you know it's pretty simple it's a, a layer of fabric uh, that's stitched through to another layer of fabric usually it's three layers there's the top just like the pretty patchwork or the applique, the pretty colors. When you think of a quilt and you see a quilt in your mind, hey, who it is? Hey, Pat. Hey, Pat, thanks for liking the stream. Looking good, Pat. Thanks so much. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, so, so when you, you someone pictures a quilt, you know, if they're not a quilt person, you know, what do they think about a patchwork quilt? What they're picturing is that patchwork top, right? And, and when you're making a quilt, people who quilt know that that's the top. So it's the quilt top. But it's not a quilt until it's quilted. Yeah, so you, ha you have that pretty patchwork top and that's your sewing machine, you're doing all that. And then you have the batting, which is the, or wadding as they call it in the UK. The, the stuff, the, the fluffy stuff, the stuff that makes it warm. So that's the second layer of the quilt sandwich. And then you have the backing fabric, right? The backing fabric. Then, and that's not usually patchwork, it's just kind of plain. Some people use a sheet, you know? And some, some the quilt police will tell you, that you shouldn't use a sheet, but you know what? <laughs> it doesn't matter. You can. It, 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 there are consequences sometimes, but um, hey, Joni, thanks so much for liking the stream. Everybody who likes the stream tonight gets a little gift from me to you. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, so, so, you know, I mean, if you wash a quilt that you made and it's got a polyester backing and, you know, cotton top, like, eh, it could be a little kind of a crack up, but it's okay, it's okay. You know, it'll probably still make somebody happy anyway. So you have these three layers and then when you stitch them together, you know, you, you stitch through all those layers and, and, and make the sandwich hold steady, then you have a quilt. You have to finish the edge. You don't want those raw edges, you know, hanging out, but you, but you turn a quilt sandwich into a quilt. And what's really great about quilts, one of the things, is that if you're an artist who's working in the medium of quilts, you have two design strategies, you know? It's really great. It's really cool. It's almost like sculpture, right? Because if you make a sculpture out of clay and then you like, I don't know, add stuff to it <laughs> or like, I don't know, score, score designs into it or something, you have like two ways to work. You know, you have the shape of the sculpture and then you have like the embellishment or whatever. I don't know. I've never really thought about that comparison, but, but maybe it works. So, so with a quilt, you have the patchwork, you know, or the applique. And we're going to talk about both kinds of quilts tonight. You have this design possibility and you can make flowers or you can make checkerboards or all this stuff 
But then you make your quilt sandwich and then you get to quilt the thing. You get to quilt it all together and you have the second design path for yourself. You know, you can quilt birds into it or you can quilt feathers into it or you can just do straight lines. But quilts are really special in terms of, you know, being art objects because you have two dimensions, if you will, for design and for your art. And I think that's pretty great. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, in fact, this show was called Quilt Church for a hot second and it's because, you know, we, we don't worship things around here, but we, we pay homage all the time. Anyway, so here we talk about that. We talk about that. We don't talk about how to make them. We talk about what they mean. Okay, so anyway. So I was thinking about <clears throat> a couple different things happened this week and you know, uh, life has been kind of weird, you know, over the past couple months, you know, me and Eric are living life, you know, life shows up, you kind of go through some struggles, whatever. And and I was talking to my doorman, Eric, uh, sorry, Derek, who, um, who's, I've mentioned him before, he's the guy, <laughs> he's the guy who, you know, I say to him like, Derek, I'm going back to the office. I gotta do my stuff. I gotta go back to the office. He's like, somebody's got to. Or I'll be like, Derek, you know you're the coolest cat on the block. And he'd be like, I know. <laughs> anyway, so I was talking to Derek and he's like, you know, somebody in this building, you know, they're moving out. You'd never, you never think of, of them moving out. You know, they look like, you know, they're doing fine. You know, they're maybe in their late fifties, early sixties. You know, they, they look like they got it all together. He's like, but they, you know, they're moving out. They can't. They've, they've fallen on hard times and whatever. And I was like, whoa, he didn't say their name or anything. You know, he didn't he didn't uh, betray who it was, but I mean, he was like, you never know about people, right? And so when my friend talked to me tonight about, you know, his struggles, you know, I, it's, it's, you never know what somebody's going through. You really don't. And I've often thought like, you know, so you get caught off in traffic and it's like really annoying, you know, but you don't know, and this is a very compassionate way to think about it. And like, I don't always do this, but you know, if somebody cuts you off in traffic, it's like, you don't know. Like maybe they're like rushing to get to somebody who's injured or hurt or, you know, they've only got so much time with, you know, their kid on like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know. So in your best moments, the angels of your better nature, hey, Betty. <whistles> Betty, did you hear it? I don't know. Let me turn it up. For you, thanks for uh, liking the stream. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, you don't you don't know what somebody's going through. So 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 the intro quilt tonight is reflecting that. I I, I scrambled and I found something that felt that felt really good for that tonight. Um, and so I'll show you that now. I will tell you that tonight we're gonna watch a video together. Oh yeah yeah. We're gonna watch a quilt guild, uh, a panel of ladies talking about their quilt guild that we started last week. And then and but before that. That's our big, that's our main dish. But before that, we're gonna talk about birds in quilts. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, and I was talking to a quilt nerd this afternoon and I mentioned in passing that I got a flyer from Ace Hardware uh, for a sale on bird feed. And it said, February is National Bird Feeding Month. Hey Cindy, thank you so much. Mm. All these attractive people tonight liking the stream, I appreciate it. Um, it's National Bird Feeding Month. So I was like, oh, birds. So we're gonna look at some birds on quilts. I've got some really, really great examples. So we'll do that and then we'll watch a video and that's what's up. Stephanie Cake, as I get the intro quilt going, how you doing? I am good. Awesome. I had a sloppy Giuseppe for dinner okay, and yes, my I, stomach is full. What is a sloppy, excuse me. What is a sloppy Giuseppe? A sloppy Giuseppe is a sloppy Joe made with marinara. Oh, I love, mm, I love marinara sauce. I, I mean, I, I love a saucy pizza. I love a saucy spaghetti. I love, I love it. So it's a sloppy Joe with marinara sauce. Oh, that sounds mm -hmm. so good. Yeah, like a sweet marinara. Like it's, it's ketchup and marinara mixed together. <laughs> I'm very, very, yes, very happy it's about dinner this. of champions. Yeah. Was this, did, did the family enjoy these together? Or were you like, I'm doing a sloppy Giuseppe. I got a show. I'm out. Or was it like a family oh, yeah. meal? Oh, no. We don't do family <laughs> meals. I, yeah. My husband and my son are my, my roommates only. Yes, yes. We do eat, we do eat together sometimes. Sure, but. sure. God, a sloppy <laughs> Did you have like a hoagie bun? Did you have like a buttered, toasted uh, you know, actually, hoagie bun? Actually, it was a toasted potato roll. 
when they're toasted they have a lot of uh architectural integrity i guess <laughs> you know to stand up to the you know, regular hamburger bun sometimes can't take nope the the weight of a cheesy <sighs> sloppy joe no no so, no no yeah. you know a pretzel bun a pretzel bun might not be a bad idea Ooh, pretzel buns pretzel. are awesome but i don't know about the marinara the yeah pretzel. no you're right they'd be fighting they'd fight yeah they'd yeah. fight you know, I think I might ask Eric, I might text him on the sly, to send me a picture. I made chili last night. Oh, good heavenly days. It's, you know what, it's the best chili I've ever made in my life. It really was. It, and it was from this cookbook, this, you know, The Plant Paradox or something, something I don't know. But it, no, it was meatless and it had, oh, oh God, it was an Instant Pot thing. D that was damn good, that chili. I'll get the recipe. I mean, it, oh my, I mean, Eric. It's chilly season, you know? Exactly. It's chilly season. It's like we're degrees. coming up upon the quote unquote big game. Oh, that's I think we're right. probably not allowed to say it in the U.S. without getting sued by the NFL, but. Oh, that's, oh, oh really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can't use the word Super Bowl on anything without permission. Well, you, you know, know I've They're got. They're like Disney. They sue everybody. <laughs> You know, my favorite bowl at home, we've got several bowls, but my favorite bowl, it's just, it's just really great. You know, it's kind of superlative. I, I'd say it's a Super Bowl. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, NFL? What are you going to do? Okay. <laughs> God. Babe. Babe's in the chat. Oh, my God. My great cats and Angelina. Oh, my God. It's all my friends. Mishral and Robin. Robin. Hello, my dear. I was just thinking about you. We were just talking about you. Mean cake. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother Nature, Mother Nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I need to send you something, dear. And Wonky too, right next to each other. Wonky and Mother Nature. I need your address. Um, slow so. It's great to see you too. L Reader, hi L Reader. It's great to see you, Jake Home Jellies. You know L Reader. Um, I don't know if I've ever given you a welcome basket or not. I'm not sure, but I certainly want to do it now. Anybody who's new. Uh, you know, the it's great to see it, uh, see the show on YouTube and Facebook. We multi-stream and, you know, we send it out there. But the party's on Twitch. It really is. It's really cool. You don't have to be afraid. And you can subscribe and you can get fun stuff. L Reader, you subscribe with Prime. You've been subscribed for seven months. I am for sure. Uh, in I've set, definitely said hello to you before with a welcome basket. I've said hello to you before. But did I give you a welcome basket? I don't know. The point is... I'm really glad. Thank you so much for supporting the show for seven months with Amazon Prime. Cool jobs by Ivana. Ivana, I love you so much. It's so good to see you. Drink wine and so Lynn. Flying peace. Flying peace. Now, mm-hmm. I need to send you this. Okay, I got to get going with the show, but flying peace, I really like your name. Flying peace. I am really glad you're here. Welcome to Quilt Nerd. Okay. Slim quilt pants. What? Slim quilt pants. Cake, did you see that? That person come through? Jill. I did, and it looks like Slim's been uh, uh, following, subscribed for a while. Heck I'm yeah. sorry we didn't notice you before, but thank you for mentioning yourself. I am so <laughs> glad that you said hello, perhaps from the Lurker Lounge. It sounds like you are from the Lurker Lounge. Uh, we love our Lurker Lounge people. Even if you never say hello, you're valued at Quilt Nerd. Okay, okay, I'm going to say hi to other people, but i got to go on. I don't want to take too long, and I've chatted, chatted away. Okay, so here... Here is what came came up. This is in, we got a lot of books tonight. This is all book stuff, okay? The Fine Art of Quilting. In fact, I can show you right here. This is the book. Uh, we're gonna talk about this book again. Another, another uh, quilt from this book will be shown on the show. The Fine Art of Quilting by Vicki Barker and Tessa Bird. And I gotta tell you, I, I know, listen, somebody should keep track. I mean, but there are, okay, I'm telling you, there are a few books that I'm like, you gotta have it. You really gotta have it. This one. This, this one. You know, yes. I, I don't have this one. This is one I do not have. Page for page. This is a hell of a book. It has got really good art in it. And it's all quilts. It's, it's great. It's really great. Um, and we have, we're an A Books affiliate, so if you buy this book you know, which is out of print right through the through the link that cake puts in the chat um then we get like a few cents right and, and i mean i don't know sometimes i get like 50 dollars. seriously like <laughs> over a couple months i do and it's really great you know it pays the pays the the 
the thing I do that, that pays for the music that I can play and not get copyright struck. So anyway, so use our affiliate links. It's a great book. So this, this quilt is called Conversations with My Father. Yeah, Conversations with My Father. It was made in 1985 by Joan Schultz, who is a very uh, prolific quilt maker, art, art quilter, we call them. Um, the art craft thing, we talk about it a lot. We're not going to talk about it tonight, whether there's a difference between art and craft and all that stuff. We're not going there tonight, but we do go there sometimes. But Joan Schultz, I'm going to read you what she has to say about this quilt, but also check this out. So that's Conversations with My Father. Okay, I'm going to hide the chat for a second because I want... I want to uh, I want you to get the full effect here, um, and I will also um, hold on. Let me see. I'll also kind of make myself a bit smaller because it's really you know it's it's like a painting, and Joan Schultz is going to talk about that. So let me read to you what she says in this fine art of quilting book, okay? Because because there's this, there's conversations with my father, and there's also a poem for my mother. Yeah, a poem for my mother. So it's a diptych. Right? There's two quilts here in this, uh, in this work by Joan Schultz in 1985. Right? Joan Schultz, quote, When I was growing up, I never looked at the sky and was not aware of landscape. I was aware of cityscape, sidewalks, buildings, and so on. It wasn't until I moved to California that I suddenly started looking at mountains, at sky, stars, rivers, and ocean and it was a turning point for me. My visit to Australia influenced my work. I went on cloud searches. I drove miles and miles through red dust and minimal scenery in the Northern Territory. It's red, 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 plus blue, blue, blue sky. Not many clouds. It's absolutely magnificent. It seeped into me. Then above Hobart in Tasmania, in the early morning, Mount Wellington turned crimson. That is the color that is in the two quilts I did to honor my father and my mother. The last month that I was in Australia, I got a call, a phone call to say that my father was dying. When I returned to California, I rushed to see him. We had some conversations. It was Christmas time and I had a show in New York. The gallery had sold a piece out of this very special show, uh, and I had to make another quilt for them. I was also waiting for the phone call to say that my father was dead. I had to focus on something, so I didn't fall apart. I made a little quilt. It was a dark and gloomy piece with a few bright spots. In no way did it relate to my father. Pause. This, this is called Conversations with My Father. Okay, so this is the quilt. In no way did it relate to my father. It was all the negative stuff that I was trying to offload. The gallery liked it. It was gone for two months, and when it came back, I was shocked. I had no idea it was such a deadly and claustrophobic piece. The ideas had just flowed through. I could not have done it any other way. I don't intellectualize my work. Whenever I have, uh, the result has been very dull very boring, not me at all. It's not that there is no content to my work. Uh, there is no life to it, spont no spontaneity, no feeling of joy. That's the difference. With the conversations of my father running over and over in my mind, I started painting fabric. He had told me what he was going to see when he went on his journey. He had ideas that he would meet the Indians and talk with them. He was going to flow freely there would be no pain. It was a happy place. We made jokes during those last three days. I said to him, I was going to run through the clouds. So that's what I tried to put into the quilt. I called conversations with my father. In Poem from My Mother, I wanted to tell her how much I really cared about her and what I thought about her life. There are two eras in her life, youth and old age, which are definitely separate. I belonged more to her youth. There are 17 years between the oldest and youngest child. Interesting. 
I gave her this youth and gave her these images. Oranges for Christmas. Fish on Friday. The fabrics were chosen specifically with my mother in mind. When you get older, you get paler. Sometimes you become invisible. The children don't want to see you. You cannot do as much. And for a lot of old people, it becomes a very gray existence. So there is a little bit of color in there, but she's fading. She's also dropping off the quilt. This is partly because she is not so involved in my life as she was when I was a child, and partly because several of her children have written her off totally, not accepting her for who she is and not willing to make allowances. I could not do a painting using such images because the process does not lend itself to that meditative state that you have when you are working through a very slow process. By the time you have appliqued one cloud, you have given yourself that concentrated time to go very deep into what you are really trying to do. It allows you time to think. So, um, conversations with my father and poem for my mother, both 1985 Joan Schultz, uh, in this book, The Fine Art of Quilting by Vicki Barker and Tessa Bird. And part of the reason I think that book is so great and so strong and so worth getting um, is because the artists speak about the work and there are artists from different countries um you know mostly europe um but it's you know it's got artist voices in it i mean there's i think an introduction by barker and bird and then otherwise it's the artist speaking about their work so you can see it's very powerful right um so yeah there you go good right good stuff hey jan uh, Mishral, hello, hello. Okay. So, that is that. Now, are you ready? I've got, I, I, are you ready for this? You ain't ready. You're not ready. Stephanie Cake knows this. You know. So from that to this, I have news. And then we'll look at some birds, okay? So you know that the Fabric of a Nation exhibit at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Museum of Fine Arts Boston, was last year, and my mom and I were gonna go, and then it was Omicron. We just couldn't do it, man. We just couldn't, we didn't wanna put other people at risk, we didn't wanna put ourselves at risk, we had to stay home, shield in place. So we didn't go. Well, right now, at the Skirball Cultural Center in the Los Angeles area, the Fabric of a Nation exhibit is showing. It's not the entire exhibit. It's a lot of it. It's 37 quilts from that exhibit, okay? And they're showing it at the Skirball Cultural Center through March 12th. It's going on right now. And I forget when it opened, but it's only on through March 12th, okay? Well, I got an email today in response to my query. Quilt nerd. Oh, okay, hang on hide this because I really worked hard on this graphic. Quilt nerd! It's going to be all up in this, people. That's right. Are you ready? March 7th. You better, you better listen and you listen good, people. You listen good! Okay, now I'm going to go back because I... Okay. March 7th. 2023. March 7th, 2023. Mary and Marianne Fonz. Los Angeles fabric of, <laughs> okay, a nation quilt exhibit live stream. That's right. I emailed the Skirball. I was like, hello, 
how are you? Good to, hello? And I was not, you know, I was very humble. I mean, like, oh God, I'm, I was very humble. It was really hard. No, I just meant like, hello. I wasn't like, hello, do you know who I am? I was just like, hello, you know, I'm, blah, blah, I'm a, you know, live streamer, blah, 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 and, you know, my mother, you know, blah, blah, whatever you'd love to come. And, you know, blah. I don't, I forget how I said it. It was not cringy at all. Don't worry about it. Anyway, I was like, there are no tickets available on March 7th. Cause I'm telling you people from March, like at the end, maybe they haven't released the tickets yet, but you can't get a ticket for like all of March. And I don't know what that means, but I was like, could we come? Cause mom and I, the schedules, you know, whatever. And I asked them for permission, not only to come on March 7th when there were no tickets available. I mean, it was really, you know, I was like, Ugh. I was like, can I also live stream from the exhibit for the people that I reach? And they took a minute and I had to follow up. I sent another email and they said, yes, I know. So do you, let me just reiterate, March 7th, time TBD. I don't know what time yet. All I know is what, what what time the live stream is going to be. Let me just, mom and I are going to go to Los Angeles and we're going to go to the exhibit and we're going to live stream from the exhibit and we have permission not only from the Skirball but also from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, which was the holdup, by the way, because the very, very responsible young man who's working there had to make sure it was okay with the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, right, that we could do this. And so he got permission and he let me know today and I sent him an effusive email and I was like, yes. And mom and I got on the phone and we set our plans and we're going to go to LA and we're going to go there. And on March 7th, there's going to be a subscriber only stream for you from the freaking exhibit. Are you freaking out? Time TBD. Okay. What I can tell you is, okay, see, are you freaking out? Are you freaking out? Yes, because it's very cool. I mean, if you're freaking out, that's really good. This is a very big deal. It's a very big deal. Now, it's subscriber only. Why? Oh, sorry, that's my next slide. It's subscriber only because, hang on, hang on. Let me go to this, okay. Because I love my subscribers. The subscribers who support this show, you're the reason the show can happen. I'm not kidding. I know I make it look easy, but I mean, it takes so much and, and, and I, I so value you. So, you know, Quilt Nerd is free to watch, right? But if you want the fun stuff, you know, you have the emotes and the giveaways and all that stuff, you know, you, you kick a few bucks into the kitty and it, it really makes a difference, you know? So if you subscribe at any level, you get this extra stuff, you know, Iowa Quilt Museum, Quilt Museum in Nebraska, and stuff like this, oh my God, we're gonna go to LA and I'm gonna have my gimbal, you know? And I'm gonna like, it, so it's not rocky, it's not like you have to watch like, you know, like this. You don't have, that's not gonna happen. Ooh. It's gonna be nice and smooth and you can see all the quilts and we, and you know, it's gonna be great. That's cool, right, Kate? I mean, oh my God, cause not everybody can go, but now you can go through the quilt nerd. Oh my God, when you told me I freaked out. I know, I was like, Ugh. I was like typing, I was like, Ugh. cause I just got it and I, you know, I don't want you to find out on the show because like, what if you were like, what? Like it just, we need to be, <laughs> we are as one, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but, but I mean, it, it happened right before the show. It's very exciting. This is, no one else, listen, I mean, maybe other people are doing like deep quilt thoughts on another live stream show. But I know that no one, I mean, no one else is live streaming from that show. Nobody, nobody. I mean. Well, and so many of us will never get to see it. You know, I mean, I couldn't make it to Boston. I mean, Jill no. lives near there, so it's great. Right? I, but I yeah. can't make it up there. Yeah. I'm not going to be in LA anytime soon. So I don't, and I don't know where it's going next, but yeah. It's pretty great. So, so if you like this content, if you're like, oh my God, I get to go to these cool shows and my mom's going to be there. So we're going to be cutting up. It'll be a crack up. Um, it's really fun, right? It's so much fun. Oh my God. It's so much fun. Hey, Kay. Um, oh, oh, and oh yes. So Kay and Dee Dee. Thanks, Dee Dee. Sherlock, what's up? Um, <laughs> oh God, Kate, can you write, can you write in the chat what's happening? Cause you're like, like she's in a meeting. I love it. I love it. anytime you're like misbehaving and watching Quilt Nerd. I wish I could give you like extra points. So that's the other thing I didn't mention. If you were in the area, so let me tell you this. Okay, two, two more things. So one thing, so the Skirball, they're so great. They're so great. They're so great. He said, come at 9.30 a.m. Oh, this is so, so the time is TBD because what I don't know 
is exactly what time will go live because they said come at 9 30 a.m and have two hours in the exhibit to acquaint yourself with the exhibit before we open the doors so i don't know if that's like that we'll do the live thing before the doors open or if i don't know what that means okay so that's why the time is tbd what's cool is that it's a tuesday and tuesdays are quiltner days so i'll let you know believe me as soon as i know i'll tell you and so the but the other thing is if you're in the area or if you want to be in the area come on what i don't what i can't promise of course is if you know i i, I don't well I can promise that mom and I will do like the live stream. Like I'm not going to like invite a bunch of people to be like, hey, Skirball, like there's 20 people here. Like, well, I thought it was fine. So no. But like if we do the live stream and then anybody who wants to like go through the exhibit, like we'll hang out with you. We'll go through it again. Like, oh my God, that'd be so much fun. And then we'll like go to lunch. This does not cost anything. I don't care. Like, I don't know. Like just come and hang out. Like, ah, <sighs> oh, so cool. So by the way, I got this new like stool that I'm like, if you hear like a rude noise, like it's just me, like, I don't know. Now it's not doing it, but anyway. So that's, that's pretty fun. So on March 7th, Mark, what's up? Mark, it's so good to see you. Sit me back. Fresh water. Um, Jill, so good. Oh, Jill is the best. Um, okay. Anyway, so that's fun. And also, what one thing that's very interesting, this, so the Skirball doesn't have all of the quilts. I'm wondering if they have the Bertha Nextroth quilt. I'll just find out. I'm not even, well, if I'm in close communication with them over the next month, you know, I might be able to ask, you know, uh, if they have that Bertha Nextroth Easter quilt in the show. But what they do have are some LA area uh quilt makers, right? So so I, this is not, so this is Carolyn Maslumi. This is a strange fruit. Uh, this is in the show. I don't know if it was in the fabric of a nation. I didn't see it in the book, so I don't know if this is an addition. But this is a uh, Maslumi uh, Strange Fruit uh, made in 2020. This is in the show. Okay. And um, hang on now. Uh, and also, uh, I saw a picture when I was looking at different uh, news articles about it. I, a, a picture of Luke Haynes came up about, you know, having LA area makers but luke doesn't live in la anymore anyway so there are other local folks whose work is in the show um and Mas this piece by maslumi is in the show this piece called uh, fabric of humanity repairing my world made in 2020 karen karen tab c-a-r-o-n tab karen tab is in the show so, so some of these, th these pieces I'm showing you, I've just got one other one, are not in the book. So, so that's exciting. You know, it's really Dee Dee said Luke is back in L.A. He is back in L.A. Great. Well, well, maybe I'll just ring up my friend Luke. Hey, Luke. What's going on? Maybe he'll meet us there. Maybe we'll have lunch. Maybe I'll meet his wife. Never met his wife. That's interesting. That's exciting. Oh my God, I can't wait. That's great, I'll call him. Oh, sorry, hang on. And then, and this is wonderful. This is in the show. This is uh, uh, a quilt maker once known, uh, African-American, uh, circa 1940, a double wedding ring from Missouri. It's a very famous quilt and this will be in the show. So yeah, pretty awesome. Yeah, Jill, thanks, right? Like there's some there's some new stuff. Hey, Lisa. Um, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is in the show and it's great. So there, there's a, a good article in the LA Times about the show. Oh, and, and, hang on now, one other thing, one other thing. Um, let's see, Fabric Nation, Sabrina, Gishwantner, I can never spell her last name, which is not surprising. So Sabrina uh, Gishwantner, who's an LA artist who does the film quilts, I can't get it right now, but it's, well, she is, uh, I know her. I know her. We interviewed her for a Quilt Folk article, and we've talked on the phone a couple times. She's very cool. Uh, this isn't the piece that's in the show, but she is the person who does uh, these these works of art. Uh, it's film, celluloid film, uh, and uh, she created, well, I should, shouldn't zoom in quite yet so that's the celluloid film cut you know into uh quilt patterns right and she's uh i mean she's like 
I don't know. It's like she's like this famous artist living in LA and she's sort of like live and like, you know, she has like probably like perfect children and it's like, oh my God. But she's like really nice so you can't like be annoyed. Um, anyway, she's really good. One of her works is in MoMA, uh, at least one of them. Anyway, she's, she's cool. Uh, and I don't know if it's this one or not, but the film that she actually used in one of the pieces at least is uh, Quilts and Women's Lives by Pat Ferrero, that film about quilters. Yeah, cool, right? Like, talk about two layers, very cool. So, um, yeah, so, so one of her pieces is in, is in the show, I'm so excited. All right, so now, without further ado, thank you for listening to that exciting announcement. Um, let, let's, let's, let's shift, let's shift gears. Um, I am going to, show you a couple I hope that wasn't too abrupt sorry I just want to keep things pushing so so I read this thing about you know bird seed being on sale and we have a bird feeder and during the pandemic we were you know putting bird feed out in on our fire escape and it was really nice you know and I'm not like a nature person but I I liked it I liked watching you know nature in the city um those birds are really hungry. I mean, they eat, <laughs> they eat, they eat their weight in bird seed. Okay. And apparently this is February is the hardest month for birds to survive. I didn't know. And yeah, and I, it's cold and food is scarce yeah. in February. I, you know, I didn't really know it. And so Ace Hardware is like, it's national bird feeding month because it's really hard for birds to survive. I was like, Oh my God, it just, it touched it. It, my heartstrings, they were plucked, they were plucked. And so I was talking to a quilt nerd today and uh, and I was saying something about, I don't know how it came up, but I was like, oh, birds, that's what I'll do for the show tonight. So so this is uh, this is that. Just a few quilts with some birds to, to I don't know, what, it's what we do here. We just kind of take an idea and run with it and there's always quilts to meet us, right? So uh, one of my favorite quilt makers is Fran Soika. Fran Soika, who is, has passed away, this was in this book. Um, which and, and I went to find this book because I knew that this quilt was in it, and that's how I found those Joan Schultz quilts, the poem for my mother, um, and is it poem for my mother? And hold on now, what was the one for her father called? It was called Conversations uh, with My Father. Conversations with My Father, exactly. So this quilt is also in that book, and Francoica. It's called The Parakeet and the Mermaid. See, see the birds um and this is based on the work of Henri Matisse Henri Matisse and uh it's just terrific she she Francoica is one of those people that's on my list uh, of quilt makers to look into more deeply she did work for uh, Ed Larson the artist Ed Larson um but she there's never there's not much about her out there which makes me want to look at her more and I have something I want to talk about on Saturday night about research, researching uh, the person I'm researching, Bertha Mextroth. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's really easy to research the person I'm researching very deeply because, like, I don't know, she was in, like, the society pages. And for the next person I research, I want, I want to get, I want to find somebody who's a little harder, if you will, to find information about because they weren't in the society pages, if you get what I'm saying. Anyway, so friends like a isn't there's not much written about her but she was published a lot and she lived in Ohio uh she did a lot of work that got some attention she sewed for Ed Larson the artist folk artist um she worked on a quilt by Ed Larson that is in the Fabric in the Nation exhibit I don't know if it'll be in LA next month in March but um but she was a fan of Matisse and she there's another quilt that she did uh after Matisse that I didn't put into the show, but I can find very quickly. Um, I just glanced down at the chat and Quirk Quilt says, Mary, if you know anyone who needs a digital editor, hey, Lindsay Milan just lost her job at APQ. Oh, no kidding. Really? Uh, Quirk Quilt's interesting. You know, I, I, it'll be hard for me to remember that here, but like, like, shoot an email right or, or Kate, can you just like make a note of that? I, I, I just did. Okay. Yeah, okay. I did. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Cake, everybody. Stephanie Cake. Um, amazing. So, uh, yeah. So, anyway. So, Fran Soika. So, the mermaid and the parakeet after Henri Matisse. Thank you, by the way, uh, for that tip. 
Okay, it's lovely. Um, and then, okay, so what's really cool, so let me go over here. So the Art of the Needle, and all of these quilts are available, you know, through our Amazon, or our uh, A Books link, okay? So if you want one of these, click on the link that Cake puts in the chat, and that'd be great. So Art of the Needle is uh, one of the, there's a number of books from the Shelburne Museum, either produced by the Shelburne Museum or about the Shelburne Museum in Vermont. And the Shelburne Museum has a lot of really great quilts. And the, one of the books that's, you know, there's like a quilts from the Shelburne book and whatever, but this, this book is really good. Art of the Needle, 100 Masterpiece Quilts from the Shelburne Museum by Henry Joyce. And the pictures are really good. They're clear. It's high, very high resolution photographs. I, I recommend this book for sure. And uh, one of the books, or one, sorry, one of the quilts. Uh, oh, wait, I'm going to come back to that one. Oh, okay. All right. I, I let the bird out of the bag. Okay, let's talk about this one. I mean, if you're looking for quilts with birds, this one definitely qualifies. So so let's look at this. This I, I, I did the whole page. Usually I crop the, crop the book. You know, I cropped the photos out of the book, but I, I just really liked this layout. I thought it was really nice. So I kept it like this. Um, so so here's the quilt. It's a whole cloth quilt, and I'm going to read to you from, from the book what it says. So this is by Susanna Rebecca Woolley. Pheasant and Mandarin duck motif, whole cloth quilt. This woman, Susanna Rebecca Woolley, was from uh, Kings Point, Long Island. New York. Cross stitched on the back is her name, Susan Woolley, 1810. So this was made in 1810. Whole cloth, it's just, it's just one piece of fabric, right? A whole cloth quilt is just one piece of fabric on the top, and then the stuffing, and then the backing. So no piecing, no applique, no patchwork, just one piece of cloth. Um, copper plate printed cotton, it's 90 by 86 inches. And the Shelburne acquired it in 1993. Here's what they say. This English bird print, first made about 1780, wow, that's really old, was still in production in the early 19th century. Wow, look at that bird. Pheasant and mandarin duck. Where's the duck? Okay, that's the pheasant. We'll find the duck, okay. Designs with birds were particularly prevalent in English cottons until about 1820. Many examples survive in America, suggesting that they were exported after the War of 1812, as the British flooded the American market with printed cottons in an effort to stifle the young country's textile industry. <gasps> yes, that's right. They didn't like it. They didn't like it at all that Americans were starting to make their own cloth. Mm -hmm. Yep, very interesting. Where's the duck? Oh, 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 here it is. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. Nope, we're going to have to go over here. Hold on. It's right here. Look at that little scamp. Look at him. Look at him. He's trying to hide. There he is. He looks like he's got a little comb over. <laughs> he's just like, my name's Edwin. I don't know. So there's our duck and our, and, our, uh, and our pheasant. Pretty cool, huh? That's a really early one. So what I liked about getting these bird bird quilts together you know and there's so many there's so i mean birds look any baltimore album quilt has a bird without question any american eagle quilt i mean there's birds everywhere quilts and birds go well together but but then but then when i was looking at my my database i actually used the finding aid to find some of these quilts i found um this i found several quilts from japanese quilt makers that had birds in them. And this one is from, hold on now. And we have we have affiliate links for this too. Hang on now. Um, this, this is a wonderful quilt, yeah. So it's from this book, New Wave. New Wave Quilt Collections, Excellence of Excellences. Setsuko, Sagawa, and 15 American artists. This is, this is great. It's, a, it's gorgeous, and I'll just let you know, there's two editions. So there's this edition, which you're looking at right now, uh, and, man, yeah, this one. And then there is also this one. So New Wave Quilt Collections 2, Setsuko Sugawa. So this first one um, is where we see this quilt. And it's called, 
dance poem, dance poem number one. And it is by Setsuko Sagawa. It's 87 by 77 inches. And let's look at these beautiful birds. It's great. Cranes, right? Are there cranes? Cranes, I think so. And by the way, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, the way my program works, the broadcasting software I use doesn't always combine you into, well, it doesn't combine you into the chat. If you follow or like the stream or become a subscriber on Twitch, your name will pop up on the, on the screen during the show. Um, but if you're watching and you don't like, like the stream or follow or whatever, I don't see you. So if you say hi in the chat, I, I'm not ignoring you. I'm so glad you're here. I just don't see that in my feed. So, so I, I do my best. Betsy, Okay, see, I just switched over to this thing. Hey, Sharon. Okay, you see, I switched over to the thing, but I don't think to do it because I got so much going on. Anyway, I'm glad you're here. So, um, so yeah, yeah, look at these wonderful birds. Cool, right? Let me zoom back out. Hold on. Yeah. Oh, look at the way, look at that, the gradation, you know, from the, from one side to the other. It's just fabulous. I don't, now, we should do a deep dive on, uh, Setsuko Sagawa at some point, right? Because all I have here are the the beautiful images of her quilts. I mean, this book is really good. And we've got, actually, let me see. Oh, she has wonderful quilts in here. Oh, yeah, okay, we'll do, let me make a note of that. We should, we should look at her really deeply. Hold on, because that's really great. Setsuko Sagawa? Hold on. Yeah, Sagawa exclamation point okay you see I have my little quilt nerd content plan okay um so that's great so that's called yeah dance poem number one um and then there's this one see there were lots of birds in these Japanese uh quilt makers quilts and this one is called departure departure and it is 85 by 61 inches really great Really, really great. Hey, it's J.H. Kazan. Hello. Oh, ah! Oh, Lord, you screwed me up. See, I was so excited to see you. Oh, no. Well, that's not good. It's all your fault. Hmm. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Let's see. Let's just see. Hold on. Here. Here's what I'm going to do. Undo. There you go. Control Z. That's all you have to do. <laughs> that's it. It's back. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, so Departure, and this was made in 1987. Um, outlined in stitched fan shapes, interesting. Yeah, we've got little, a little Bets, Bets bud on the screen. Uh, this is really, it's remarkable. It's really remarkable. I, I don't know, there's something about the quilts that are in this book by the, by the makers um, from Japan that are just, I don't know. I, I, there, there's a research project. Just do it, do a deep dive into any one of the really master quilt makers in Japan. Um, I would love to know more about any of the, the people that I see that just blow me away, you know? They should all have their own book. Um, just one more, one more bird. Let's see. Um, oh yeah, well, oh, this is really great. So. I have more, but I, I want to. I want to keep things going. So, so this this quilt is by Elizabeth Akana. Uh, she's a Hawaiian quilt maker, and this quilt is called Jonathan, but it's called Jonathan slash My Way. Okay, Jonathan slash My Way, and this is this can be found in Robert Shaw's big book. I didn't tell you about this one. Okay, hang on one second. Well, I thought. Um, oh yeah, it's this one. It's, it's, it's this one. Quilt's a living tradition. Yeah. Cake already knew. She was like, I got it. Um, this is by Elizabeth Akana. And so, so just, just don't look away. Okay. Just, just don't, don't look away. This is the front of the quilt. Okay. This is the, the front side of the quilt. And I'm going to zoom in and you're going to see the quilting here by Elizabeth Akana, and it is magnificent, and it is ridiculous, and it is like untouched by human hands. Like this is like an angel. I think, I think actually, I think this is actually a Jonathan Holstein 
I think I'm annexing it from John, deranged angel. I think that was words he used once, some deranged angel made this thing. But I mean, this it's really, really something, this quilting here, okay? So this is the front of this quilt by Elizabeth Akana, uh, made in 1992, Jonathan. And the inspiration for this quilt comes from a book, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. That short story by, oh God, who wrote that thing? I can never remember, but I know it. Don't tell me who wrote it. Who wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull? If Kathy's here, she'll find it in five seconds. So that's Jonathan. And then the back of it looks like this. And that's called My Way. And it's the same quilt. Yeah. You see the seagull here? Recognize it, right, from the front? I know. Babe, I mean, Richard Bach. Thank you, Biscuit. That's what I do. I invented post-its. Um, yeah. So let me... Let me just, show, I mean, so that, so it's the same thing. So, so front side, Jonathan, back side, my way. And Elizabeth Akana, I mean, what she does to, to me, one of, I mean, something that's so wonderful about the quilts that I've seen that she does is she like takes this Hawaiian tradition, this grand tradition of Hawaiian style quilts, and she pushes it, you know, pushes it forward in these wonderful ways. Uh, I don't know. I could spend my whole life trying to achieve something like that and I wouldn't do it. I couldn't do it. No way. No way. Oh no. That was, I need to plug in my iPhone. Otherwise I'm gonna lose cake. I have that, okay. So, great. Disaster averted, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, amazing. So cool, right? Look at that. So that's my way. That is Jonathan. Jonathan Livingston Seagull. I forget what that, I mean, I know, I think it's kind of, it's kind of depressing, isn't it? What is that story about? Do you remember it? I, I, I know we read it in high school, frankly. I mean, I remember it, yeah, like, in high school. I, yeah, but I don't remember literally anything. So, frustrated seagull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as a frustrated existential seagull who's squabbling for food and, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. It happens. Pretty much our current, con everybody's current condition right now. Yeah, so. no, okay, exactly. Same. Same seagull. Anyway, so this was the other one. It's a traditional quilt. It's fine. It's great. It's a doll quilt, 1850, 23 by 23 inches. We're done. We're done with birds. Okay. Um, cake, I'm going to toss it to a cake break. And you can riff, you can jam. I'm going to run to the ladies' room, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to go to North Carolina and have some ladies uh, talk to us about their quilt guild, which is amazing. And it's in North Carolina and I've been really wanting to watch this video with you all. So don't leave, hang out. We're doing this. I'm gonna use the ladies room. It's cake break. It's cake break, everybody. Let's do this. Cake break, okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I gotta go, da -da -da. Mm -hmm, mm hmm Okay, do we? Do I play music for the cake break? Do, I mean, uh, no, because I, I think they have trouble hearing yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, music. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no music. Okay, I'm going to disappear. Okay, it's all you, Cake. I'll be right back. Well, so you guys, I uh, would have ordinarily told you about my delightful dinner, but Mary already brought it up. So you're going to have to hear about Dr. Dunton. <laughs> <laughs> I need to put him on the screen. I need to, like, make a little face of him. Uh oh, are you there? Cake. Oh no. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I didn't hear you talking and that makes me that makes me scared. Just a minute. Just a minute. I think we have like a zoom. Hold on. Hi. Can you hear me? Just a minute. Cake. I'm worried. I'm worried. The D man. The D man. Okay, so I am going to Hold on. We don't usually have this problem. I'm going to call her back. Yep. 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 I'm calling her back. Interesting. Very interesting. You know, that's what... Oh, I heard a, I heard a joke today. Um, hold on. <laughs> God, isn't that great? I heard a joke today. Wait just a minute. Um, here, here. What's the opposite of artificial intelligence? Natural stupidity. <laughs> oh, my God. 
<laughs> All right, let me uh, get her back here. I'm glad I didn't run to the bathroom too fast. You would have had dead air. That's bad. Okay, here, I just, I just got back on with cake. Let's see what happens. Isn't that ridiculous? I hung up on cake. I know. I had to do it. Don't be, wait, hold up. Don't be, don't be scared. Please stand by. Exactly. Okay, wait a minute. Cake, where are you? Oh, no. <gasps> I have to do the cake break by myself. What am I going to do? Let's see. I did hear another good joke. Oh, no, I can't tell that joke. Ooh. Um, nope. Um, <laughs> let me see. Let me see. Okay, I'll just, listen, I'll just tell jokes. Dad jokes. That You know that's what you Google. I know. I know. I could just, why don't I just like do a little like soft shoe? That'd be better. Um, or I could just go on with the show, but I just feel like that. Okay. Okay. I'm afraid for the calendar. It's days are numbered. Why do fathers take an extra pair of socks when they go golfing? In case they get a hole in one. Oh, okay. Please come, please come back. Um, uh, oh God. What do you call a fish wearing a bow tie? I'm sophisticated. I, I hate it so much. I can't. If April, sa oh, God. if April showers bring Mayflowers, what do Mayflowers bring? Pilgrims. Please, okay, listen. Here's what's gonna happen. <laughs> God. I knew, you knew that one, my great cats? All right. Um, just put up the Mary, we'll be right back. So, you know what? It's not a bad idea. Okay, I really need to use the bathroom. We'll be back.
Hey, hey everybody. Hi, can you hear me? You good? Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Hey, and we got cake back too. That all happened at go. the same time. Hello. Thanks for being patient. We have, uh, we have cake back on. It just like pooped out, right? Yes. My internet just went poop. And then my husband said, who are you talking to? The internet's been down for like a minute or two. You know that, right? You're like, no. Well, um, I put, you know, I yeah. put on the BRB. Mr. Screen. Cake is going to get a spanking after this. <laughs> You know what? The good kind. You know, whatever works. You know what I'm saying? Um, but anyway, we're glad you're back, and also, and we're glad you're back. And uh, yeah, so so the, the next part of the show, I really want to watch this with you. Um, there's some of the so we watched a little bit of the um, uh, African American. Uh, Quilter, quilt Circle in Durham, North Carolina. We watched a little bit of that, um, I don't know, I think it was maybe a week ago today. I think so, yeah, yeah. Um, and I thought about this uh, story because, and we'll come back to that picture, in Quilt Folk, in the North Carolina issue of Quilt Folk. And, and I work with Quilt Folk, I've worked with Quilt Folk since 2016. We're about to unveil like a really big project I've been working on really hard for the past few months. Um, but this is not, you know, a Quilt Folk channel. I'm, I'm talking about Quilt Folk because it's a really great magazine and I work with the company. But anyway, the, uh, I'm, I'm talking about this article in Quilt Folk because it was so good and it's so um, it's such a great magazine. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. I don't think Mike would really care if I was like, Quilt Folk. I mean, anyway, I know. Anyway, the point is I just, this is not a Quilt Folk program. <laughs> I don't know. Probably fine. Um, but anyway, uh, it's probably apparent. But anyway, the point is is that this article was in, the story, this feature story, was in uh, the North Carolina issue, which was, which one? It was the 23rd issue of Quilt Folk. I used to be editor of the magazine, and now Brianna Farmer is the editor, and she's doing an amazing job. Um, this article uh, was about, uh, it was called The Heritage Quilters, Creating a Home of Their Own, story by uh, Char Brian Plummer. Um, and this, uh, so this person, uh, Kimberly Pierce Cartwright, uh, this picture was taken by Azuri Watala. Um, this is one of the, uh, pictures from the story. I'll just read this, um, bit from, uh, Char, Char Brian Plummer. If you ask the heritage quilters about their origin story, they will tell you that the group was birthed from a need for community. And this is one of the members of the... When one of its founding members, Jereen Johnson, helped establish the African American Quilt Circle in Durham, where she was active while working in Durham full time, um, uh, back home in Warrenton, she found herself longing for the connections that were forged at the African American Quilt Circle. So this is one of uh, Kimberly Pierce's quilts that we'll look at while I'm talking to you about about this. Um, as fate would have it, um, mm -hmm -hmm, Jerry Ann Johnson, who we're going to hear from in just a second, connected with uh, several other women who possessed a love for quilting and had a similar longing. Upon forming, the group felt it was important to choose a space that was connected to the African-American experience, which led them to Warren County Senior Center. Okay, and that is what we saw before. Um, a historically black school, it was once home to John R. Hawkins High School. The building became a safe and creative space for the 10 inaugural members of the Heritage Quilters. So I mention this because this issue of Quilt Folk Magazine is really great, and the Heritage Quilters came from the group that we're going to talk, we're going to hear about tonight, the African American Quilt Circle in Durham. Uh, I love this picture. I think it's really great. And this quilt is fantastic. I mean, obviously, painterly, right? And I liked Joan Schultz's work tonight, the conversations with my father, poem for my mother, because she talked about painting, you know, and how quilts and painting kind of intersect. Um, and I just thought it, it all kind of dove, dovetailed nicely. Doves, birds. And by the way, that, that book, The Fine Art of Quilting, Tessa Bird. Tessa Bird. That's weird. I didn't great. get past the quilt nerds. They mentioned it, it. Did they? Did they? I am not surprised. I am not surprised. So here's another beautiful picture from that story in Quilt Folk. If you're not a subscriber to Quilt Folk, you know, it's another perk of being a subscriber, actually. I should I should get another coupon code from Mike for, you know, a 10% off kind of deal because that happens too, you know. And if you join as a subscriber, you get access to the Discord, which is kind of like our clubhouse kind of deal online when the show's not on. Um, and so I can do that. I can make that happen. 
Um, so let's watch this video where the women who started the um, the African American uh, the quilt circle in Durham talk about their experience. And uh, I've got it on 1.5 because it's long, and I we watched some of it, so we've got about. 30 minutes of the video, but I'm playing it at 1.5. So we'll see if it's a little too fast, uh, I can slow it down to 1.25. Um, it's great. And I like hearing them talk about the story. Um, sometimes, um, when videos are longer, I try to speed them up because, you know, it's 2023 <laughs> and sometimes we don't, but if it, but if it doesn't, if it's not good, we'll, we'll slow it down a little bit and we might, we'll see. Okay, so this is celebrating 20 years of quilt making. Hang on one second. Um, and we watched some of it last week, but let me just make sure I say who is speaking here. So um, this is from Scholars and Publics channel. It's got 22,000 views. It was uh, uploaded three years ago. In this wide ranging public conversation, Marjorie Diggs Freeman, Jerry Ann King, hold on. Marjorie Jane King, hang on. Whoop. Bring this up. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Marjorie Diggs Freeman, Jerry N. King Johnson, and Sauda A. Zara, all members of the African American Quilt Circle, AAQC, of Durham, North Carolina, discuss how the group got started, its history of community engagement, how politics informs its art, the history of black quilting, and the future of the form. Fellow AAQC member Kim F. Hall moderates. Um, yeah, and for more information, I'll give you that link to, okay. And I'll give it to Steph to put in the chat. Okay, let's hear what they have to say. Um, so I think this is probably a question we'll begin with Jerry Ann, but I asked the, the group to tell us a little bit about how the guild got started. Okay, now this is when the story gets good. <laughs> yeah, that's right where we left off. Not that they have not been good, but we love to talk about uh, how we got started. And um, we were here in Durham, and when I say we, Bertie Howard is someone I had known from back in the movement days. Uh, she was working for Africa News, and um, Candace um, Thomas, at the time it was Staten, yeah, Thomas, um, Candace Staten, I was really good friends with her sister, and I was just amazed at all of the work that Candace was doing. And um, Helen Sanders, um, I didn't know that well, but at that time, Helen was real active in the Durham community. So um, Sauda reminded me that Gladys Marie Fry was uh, uh, at the Humanity Center. She was a fellow there oh. and did an exhibit. Bertie. Big deal, big deal person. Do you know that person? He had talked to Gladys, uh, Dr. Fry, about her interest in starting a quilt group, and Dr. Fry uh, encouraged her to do that. Well. She had been talking about it for years, and she came by my office. I was working downtown on Main Street, and she had this dead woman's quilt scraps and blocks. And I was like, Bertie, stop. <laughs> and I said, let's set the date. That was February. I remember it. And that was February. We said March. We're going to, like, meet, and uh, we're going to stop this. And the thing that stood out, we wanted to make sure we had it in a, a place of historical significance to African Americans. And so we chose the Stanford Warren Library. And um, we decided we would just put the word out, tell everybody we knew, and we asked people to come prepared to introduce themselves through a quilt and to bring a quilt or a quilt project that they were working on at the time. And that's how it started. And at the mm. end of the meeting, the question was, do y'all want to continue this? And everybody said, yeah. And we said, where? And we said, we'll check with Haydai. The executive director at the time, who was Diane Pleasure, I think she recognized the value of having us as a, a, an art group, you know, mm. here kind of based at Haytai. And uh, she always um, understood the importance of promoting and preserving culture. So I think it was just one of those relationships that kind of grew and thank God it did because we still have a great relationship with Haytai. Um, and then we also um, started doing exhibits, like right out the gate. I mean, we had that first meeting and before you knew it, nine months later, we had our first exhibit right here. And uh, the first exhibit was called, uh, Lest We Forget, Preserving Our African-American uh, Quilting Heritage. And we had a ton of people uh, that showed up. Now, this is a young group. And our communities, the members knew people, and we knew people, and it just all kind of came together. And we have consistently had exhibits uh, every 18 months since then. And I, and I want to say, so I was looking at the website and pulling some stuff down from, from the website and just around the web. 
And I mean, there's been a ton of awards and recognitions for this group. Um, Quilting from the Heart and Soul in 2003, voted one of the 10 best art exhibits uh, by the newspaper in the area. Um, 2010, the Indies 2010 Triangle Arts Awards given annually by the Independent Weekly to honor outstanding local artists and groups who have demonstrated long-term commitment to the region and have a history of spreading cultural wealth as widely as possible. Uh, Also in 2010, the Arts Council exhibit season, uh, yeah, selected to participate in, in that major show. So I mean, they're they've done they've done big things in their community and beyond, like in the state. I think that's pretty great. I mean, what is that is that something to me to me for a guild to do that? I mean, a guild guilds do wonderful things and they do charity work and so forth. But like to be recognized as an arts association, kind of by like the bigger art association world and like the cultural. Um, forces, you know, in a in a community and beyond is, is pretty awesome. It's it, to me that's like it's kind of like guild goals, if you will. I don't know. I'm a bad guild member, so I shouldn't talk about it. But I just think that's pretty cool. Yeah, come on now. All right. It seems that African American culture of Durham has a really robust relationship with Durham, even though people come from Virginia and other parts of North Carolina. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how being in Durham has impacted, if you think being in Durham has impacted your quilting, either from the stories you tell or what you use, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about the guild relationship to the community. I was the only black child. Hang on. I think, I think it, I'm going to slow it down just a little bit. I think it's like a, it's on 1.5. I'm going to slow it down to 1.25. I just, I just want to hear what they have to say. And I think it's a little fast. In all of my classes. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Because of the area where I lived. In college, class of 300 had three black graduates. So my association with my own people was limited to church on Sunday. Now, imagine I moved to Durham in 1992. It was like I had almost landed in heaven because finally there were so many people that I could relate to personally and in so many, you know, different other uh, different ways. But when this quilt group started, I went and I was never so welcomed. I felt free to do things that weren't printed in the book didn't tell you how to do it if your points didn't match you weren't put out you know all of you know all of those kinds of things that had been put into my head uh when i arrived just evaporated and all i can say to that is thank god it evaporated i found a joy in this group i found an exuberance Mm. and i you know i could still practice those you know techniques that i had learned but i could express everything in a new way um aaqc has a marvelous community involvement more so than a lot of you realize pause i'm gonna um refresh just because i think it needs that if your thing is skipping or just kind of delaying i think it's actually on my end it's duke university sorry so when you graduates hold on so my association yeah great with I think it'll be okay State now. University. Damn. So that those by uh, Michelle Alexander okay. yeah. called the new Jim Crow. And it's really self-explanatory Sorry, of hang three. On. Hang on. Association. Yeah, there. With. I think you should be okay. My own people was limited to church on Sunday. Now, imagine I moved to Durham in 1992. Hmm. It was like I had almost landed in heaven because finally there were so many people that I could relate to personally and in so many, you know, different other, uh, different ways. But when this quilt group started, I went and I was never so welcomed. I felt free to do things that weren't printed in the book didn't tell you how to do it if your points didn't match you weren't put out you know all of you know all of those kinds of things that had been put into my head uh when I arrived just evaporated and all I can say to that is thank god it evaporated I found 
a joy in this group. I found an exuberance and I, you know, I could still practice those, you know, techniques that I had learned, mm -hmm. but I could express everything in a new way. Um, AAQC has a marvelous community involvement, more so than a lot of you realize. People don't know how active we are. And we've been active in the community since our inception 20 years ago. And we're always involved in community projects. Um, the position that I <laughs> applied for was donation quilts. Angelina, totally. Okay. <laughs> well, we make donation quilts. Now, it's lest I, I forget, you know, as you get old, you gotta to refer to your notes so you don't leave anybody out. We made donation quilts mm. for the preemies, the premature babies at UNC Chapel Hill. We made them for high school graduates at the Oxford Manor Achievement School in Durham. We made, as an incentive, to a lot of the students who were living in public housing who dropped out, mm. when you graduate, you get a quilt. Oh, that's so great! We provided oh. that quilt. We made quilts for... I mean, graduation quilt. I think it's as important as the wedding quilt, as the baby quilt, honestly. Like, graduation quilt, man, you're going, you know, you're going out on your own, even if you're still living at home. Like, you know, the graduation quilt. I think I think it's as important as any other life quilt. Don't you think, Steph? I mean, it's important. You graduate high school, it's like, listen, man, you're done with school. You gotta figure this stuff out. Here's a quilt, you might need it. You're probably gonna need it, <laughs> you know? I think it's, it's good to have a quilt for every major life event. Yeah. Good or bad, because you want to celebrate wrapped in your quilt, and exactly. you want to have comfort wrapped in your quilt. Yeah, and I mean, if it's a really good quilt, you know, helps your game, you know? It's like, come on, baby. Maybe we maybe we should uh, get together, you know? Like, we're adults, you know? <laughs> I got this great quilt. Sorry, that's gross. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, you're an adult. You got to do, you know, you need, a, you need a quilt. All right. Um, the John Hope Franklin Scholars Program at Duke University. We made them for several years for the African Children's Choir that came over That's every right, year Mark. to raise money That's for right. uh, different projects in their homeland. Nice, Angelina. Even the Burning Coal Theater, okay? Mm -hmm. But the one place where we continuously give quilts is to the homeless people. Those people who are residents, it was Genesis Home. Wow. That houses families, not individuals, but families with wow. children. And we still do that uh, today. And one of the things that really inspired me, I, I served on the board at Genesis Home for people to arrive with the clothes on their back and children in their arms, living in cars, etc. Many, many of us have made small quilts for babies. And one of the things that they do, when, once these uh, families are placed in a home, they are given a quilt for their new home. Wow. I have met some of the recipients, and you'll never know how important that is. First of all, it tells them that somebody really cares about me, that they would do this. Now, the other things that we do in the community, in, not just helping families moving forward, but we've had community quilt days where the community members come in, they bring their quilts, they tell their stories about the quilts, they share with one another. And we participated at the Museum of History in Raleigh for I guess about 15 years. Immaculata Catholic School has us come over. Just two weeks ago, we did a, a, a quilt project with children at W.G. Pearson. We're mm. actively involved in the young, with the young. But we also go to senior citizens. And we have, uh, we've been invited to programs, you know, there to talk about quilts, to show the quilts, and, and that type of thing. And if um, I wanted to say there's a really, so, so, I mean, I had a question about who, if anybody out there watching is, um, has done any, um, community community service type thing with with I mean I, I with you know homeless folks people who are not housed that kind of thing I, I just wonder about that but then I also thought of piece by piece which is out in Connecticut L uh, Lizzie Rockwell 
um, amazing. She, another quilt folk story we did, but she, she, she does this wonderful thing. She's been doing it for like 20 something years. She, she, there's a senior center and she, she gets a group of kids to meet at the senior center and they make quilts together piece by piece. Lizzie Rockwell. I mean, I mean, having, having the generations meet like that and do real simple stuff. I mean, they're, you know, they're doing quilt blocks and then they do, it's just really cool, you know? And so, so I think, I think those community projects, I mean, sometimes they're centered around a cause, you know, there's a, a quilt uh, commemorating, you know, the, the people who died of opioid abuse. I actually think that's in Connecticut too. There may be others, but, um, but you know, the senior folks and the, and the youth, like, I don't know, bringing those together. I, I love that. There's something about the very young and the very old yeah. that like get quilts. Exactly. Like, yes. Quilts. Even if they don't like get quilts, like <laughs> exactly. You know? I mean, I've never seen a small child go, "No, I don't want that quilt." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or an elderly person say, "Get that quilt away from me." Cake, you got it. Exactly. I mean, it's yes. like the people children who are like the, children and the elderly don't call them blankets. They know they're quilts. Writing it down. And it's very literally writing the, it down um, for the older people. We are really uh, a group that is well known throughout the state for as the kind of go to group for quilting, African American quilting, which is really an honor for us because it's not like we had a mission to go out and to build this kind of reputation in the community. It kind of happened organically. You know, people would come, they would seek us out versus us seeking out activities to do in the community. And I think that is a testament to our mission in the very beginning and the reputation that we built over time, uh, one year. Uh, after the next. So in an another big achievement that we received because of our uh, community uh, commitment to the community was uh, in 2010, I believe, we received the Indies Award. Yeah. And that's an award that's given every year to an, organiz an arts organization or group that has done extraordinary contributions in cultural life in the triangle. And this was a big honor for us. Mm -hmm. um, so I was telling the group, um, the, one of the guilds in Detroit had a really big exhibit uh, for Black History Month. And as you know, Detroit has been suffering under so many different hey, kinds of control, uh, racism and economic inequality. But one of the quilters in that group said that she thought that there was a really unique relationship between quilting and African-American life. And I was wondering how you guys felt about that. You kind of touched on a little bit so in your last set of comments. But um, if you wanted to talk about that. If you had a stack of quilts you had a sense of security, mm. at least in Southwest Georgia, where That's it worth writing wasn't that, yeah. like cold, like New England cold, but it was cold, uh, freezing. And so quilts represented like, you know, as a child for us, it was like having wood or paying, you know, wow. the electric bill. You, could, wow. you were secure. You had a quilt, you had a freezer with some food in it, <sighs> and you were pretty much set. You know, there was, and that was important that you had that kind of security. Um, so I think that, um, quilts have always responded to a particular environment. Uh, and I think like the quilts that you see among the African-American, um, uh, quilt circle, you will see that they are, they are responding to today's environment, like the story quilts, the narrative quilts. I mean, you know, a child is killed, Black Lives Matter, um, issues around, um, well, we, we're gonna talk some about the most recent exhibit, Threads Connecting Lives. But I would say that that tradition of having quilts to express um, stories, to express love. I mean, even if you go back to days of enslavement, even though people may not have been doing narrative quilts per se, yeah. um, they were taking pieces of scraps or fabric that were significant to them yeah. um, and including those in the quilts. Um, and every quilt tells a story, regardless of whether it's intentional or unintentional, there is a story there. So, um, and, I, and, and here's one of the things, sorry, I just wanna say like, one of the things that is has become clearer to me as I keep learning about everything is like there's one quilt in the Hearts and Hands book that we looked at by Julie Silver and Pat Ferrero and Elaine Hedges, I think. Um, 
and it's this checkerboard quilt and it, it doesn't it doesn't look like anything like it and it and it doesn't look like a quilt that people identify with like coming out of the south like g's bend or whatever it's, it's just it's a checkerboard quilt like a 16 patch and it was made by an enslaved person and it survived and i just i just feel like you know part of the the reason we should save quilts and i know we can't save them all and i know some of them are just they're just done like I, I get that of course of course I do but but every quilt does tell a story and some stories like I was saying earlier like Bertha Mextroth who this person I'm I'm you know in fact I wrote this impassioned you know post for the discord and then I waited to post it because I just thought I should wait until I wasn't so impassioned but like the next story I researched like needs to be harder it needs to be harder it needs to be like it needs to be harder because because there are stories that need to be told anyway so like you know every you know every quilt ha does have a story and you know, this woman's talking about like you know even when people didn't have much you know they made quilts to because they needed them you know if it look this woman said if you had a stack of quilts you had a sense of security she said it was like firewood you know and so you know looking at the different quilts that survived from you know the south when people were slaves it's like they're so important and you don't always know where a quilt comes from the quilt that i'm thinking of which i can find and show you but but the quilt that i'm thinking of doesn't look like an african-american quilt as such as a lot of people think that 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 quilt looks like i mean there there are regional differences sometimes but i mean the quilt that i'm thinking of just looks like a checkerboard it looks like a 16 patch you know and so so protecting these things or doing our best to just try to find out about them and it's it's really it's really important because every quilt really does tell a story and it's our heritage. It's, it's all of our heritage. It's American heritage, period. You know what I mean? I think that that's, um, that's one of the aspects of how African-American quilts are unique or quilts are unique in the African-American experience. One other thing I would say, um, during the periods of enslavement, African-American women oftentimes were instructed to do quilting by their mistresses or you know the woman in the big house and um, they were expected to do them in a certain kind of way. But the quilts that were in the quarters that the women had less time were altogether different. They could have been made with uh, burlap sack bags or feed bags, or they could have been, the batting may not have been cotton batting, but it would have been straw or an old quilt. I remember we had lots of quilts that were made with old quilts as batting. Um, and I think from that experience, African-American women, there was something, um, you know, there was, that was wow. part of the freedom thing, you know, because you knew that mm. there were these mm. expected, you know, there were these patterns, but you had fewer resources, less time, and you had to make it work, you know, because you had folk to keep warm too. So I think some of those threads continue today in how we approach quilting, you know, that risk-taking, um, that, you know, I, I, I think that's enough said. I could talk all day about quilting um, before the guilds became very active and about promoting it as an art and as a history. I love um, this Suffered woman. from the kind of invisible, <laughs> invisibilization just... of black labor in general. And so if you looked in museums, and my mother is, I, I have to kind of give a shout out to my mom because she is like, I want to tear about this. If you go to museums, they will often attribute quilts to the mistress of the household or the owner mm. of the plantation. And, not, and it's only in the past like 10 to 20 years they've actually been kind of making clear to visitors that the quilts in fact were by the enslaved women or the women who were sharecropping who were making for themselves and also for the household. And so that's, you know, so the tradition of African American quilting goes back to the first days of, of um, Africans being brought here. And so I think that's that's a kind of beautiful service that the guilds provide, and particularly AAQC and kind of making sure people understand this this history is kind of an art and a labor of love that continues through generations. And so people have their own archive. If they have quilts from their family, you have an archive. And so I hope if you're here, if you're friends, you know, that you encourage them to take photos and, and name who made the quilts mm -hmm. because it's only fairly recently that we've been encouraged to put labels on every quilt we make. And so a lot of the quilts that are part of our family collections are not, you know, after a few generations, people forget. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to take this as a soapbox moment to say, please, please yeah. document your family quilts. Yeah. I th thank you. Uh, you know, th that raised an interesting question. And this may have been sort of an unspoken uh, principle in the organizing of African American Quilt Circles, because we chose not to like attach guild to our name. 
Oh, that and okay. Part of what we understand the role of a guild is to prepare folk to do stuff in a certain way. You know. Okay, let me just let me just okay. I just want to say that it's the African American Quilt Circle. Okay, African American Quilt Circle. So just okay, continue. But I just wanted to put that out there. It was um, really important at certain in certain points of history for women particularly to be able to demonstrate their sewing skills and their literacy skills because they needed to get a husband. Wow. And the, you know, the father would say, see what my daughter can do. Wow. <laughs> we didn't go that route. And I wanted to add, I didn't share this with you guys, but I was at Tougaloo in the Tougaloo wow. Archives about two weeks ago, and I was looking through the course catalogs from the found, from, well, the earliest ones they have, which are in the 1870s, and quilting was part of the curriculum, which I was really surprised to see. Oh, really? So my other question, which you've all kind of, you know, already touched a little bit, is about whether quilting expresses, how quilting expresses your politics, and whether that expression of your politics have changed over time. The election of President Obama brought about a really major change in quilting. There was, there was such excitement. And there was a, I guess there's, there were books put out. I mean, there was a book, uh, Journey of Hope, that's what it was called, Journey of Hope, mm. where people all oh, across yeah. the United States, oh, yeah. quilters, submitted a quilt mm. that talked about the importance of, of that particular event. And it was a, an exhibit, Maslumi's exhibit. I, I'm, Pretty sure, and I think Michael Cummings' famous quote was in there. I should make sure, but I think so. Okay, and in, it, in addition to that, now it's taken on still another aspect with women's rights. You know, feminism has been around, you know, I drive for a long time, but you know, usually black women were too busy trying to struggle to make it, to get, you know, to just go from day to day to day, let alone jump on a bandwagon. But now, I want you to know that we have a freedom of expression that is appreciated. Our work was not always appreciated. There are, uh, I have to mention this one person, you know who it's going to be? Dr. Carolyn Maslumi mm. has spent years promoting African-American quilting in different aspects. And... She was one of the first to do a lot of these exhibits. And we talk about what is going to, you know, I guess, happen down the road. Who knows what's going to happen? But her next exhibit, and I think you have a quilt in that. I know I do. And it's called Envisioning Human Rights mm -hmm. in the New Millennium. We each selected a particular basic human right. I chose freedom of expression, and I think, Sa'uda, you chose leisure. Yes, you the said right. the right to leisure. Mm -hmm. But there are like 29 or 30 of them, and that is going to open up this ah, sorry, sorry. sometime in June. It's a little delayed. But again, ah. it's and it, it is showing sorry. how we are moving ahead in society as a whole. We are free to express our opinions. Um, I have always um, used my quilts as a second voice to express things that were important to me. Um, and things that matter show up in my, in my quilts. Like for example, with Trayvon Martin, um, this very first quilt, uh, it has fabric from one of my dear friends. Um, we were active in the civil rights uh, movement together and he was in exile in Tanzania and he sent me that fabric. And this piece here, I'm just looking at it, I'm like, I know it was in there, but it's sitting here like, here I am. <laughs> this is one of the pieces that he sent back. So that is just an expression of uh, me just putting him and what his struggle was and his politics was in, in this quilt. I love this video, it's so well done. Um, audience question, can quilts engage meaningfully with complex political situations? They're going to get to it, and I just want to let you know that um, in at the Quilt Museum in Nebraska, the International Quilt Museum right now, through uh, March 25th, I believe, um, Carolyn Maslumi curated an, an exhibit, Uncovering Black History, quilts from the collection of Carolyn Maslumi. Um, and she says, quote, when one faction of American society is excluded from the master narrative, our collective histories, the whole society loses. 
So I'm going to put this in the chat. If you are anywhere near the Quilt Museum, you should be going all the time. You should be a member. And this is um, going on right now. Carolyn is looking at it. I just put it in the chat. Oh, here. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Cake. Okay. So here we go. You have to ask yourself, why do you make a quilt? And I don't propose to make a quilt to answer everybody or anybody's question. Uh, I would like to think that a quilt that has some political connotations or whether subversive or what not, whatever, to encourage you to think about it and to go do your own research and to explore more on your own. It's about sparking a conversation. Mm. It's not about you looking at it and you deriving all of the answers. It's not, that's not the purpose of why someone may make a quilt like that. And, and that's what I do. It doesn't matter at all if anybody says anything about that quilt or like it or dislike it. It's more about me mm. expressing what is important to me and my heart and my feelings about a situation. And if, some, if I can attract someone's attention to that topic, that's, that's the gravy or the icing mm. on the cake. I'll put it that way. <laughs> so I think it's really about constantly asking yourself, why mm. do you quilt? And why mm. do you make a particular quilt? And once you're clear on that, it's up to the viewer to reach their own conclusions about it, whether it stops them after they leave that quilt or whether it encourages them to go and to learn and seek out more information. Uh, Small Town Roots, thank you so much for subscribing. You've been subscribed for 13 months. And you know what she said is so, it's so great because we're so polarized, right? And it's like good for someone to say, you know what, it's okay if you don't agree with me. My purpose is to tell you how I feel and maybe spark an idea, a conversation with somebody else. Like that's so important and that's a really good way to put it. It's like I can feel a certain way and make a quilt about it. It doesn't mean that you have to feel that way. It means that this is how I feel and maybe if you see my work, if you see my art, you'll think about something. You might not agree with me in the end of it, but that's the conversation. I mean, that's human communication, right? It's so important. It's so good. To give you an idea, at our last exhibit, Annette Bailey, who's teaching a class now in Norfolk at a black quilters get together, right, okay? She suggested that we uh, put up some, or make a quilt that is reflective That's right, of Angela. the pressures of today and what's happening today. You know, it's not limited to Black Lives Matter or gun violence or gang violence or black yeah. on black crime or human trafficking. But what has happened? We all did our quilts, we had them up there. Those quilts have gone to different locations and served as an impetus mm. and to open discussions and conversations about racism and inequality. I think all black quilts are political. And I think that because mm, interesting. they are a testament to survival and they also, in the earlier quilts, they are meant to protect and keep comfortable families. And when we were born here, we were not meant to survive. We were meant to labor and die. Mm. And we were not meant to have families. And so I do think that even quilts that are abstract quilts that somebody made for their family or an enslaved woman made for her child, that it is a political act because it's about asserting autonomy over yourself and over your family. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I learned when researching um, slave quilts, when the slaves made their quilts, they would actually sew inside the quilt an herb that they used in Africa. Really? They would put in a piece of fabric. And different little things like that were actually sewn into the quilt. And in addition, because they didn't have time to do all the stitching in and out and so forth, they tied their quilts. Mm. And there was a particular knot that they used to tie the quilts, and that knot was to serve as protection for the person sleeping under wow. the quilt. Uh, one of the things that we're faced with in this 21st century is mm. how do we deal with ambiguity, not knowing what's gonna happen? And particularly if we do things in a different way, if we approach our community work uh, in a mm. more equitable way or our school mm -hmm. work, you know, towards um, peace and equity, but we don't know what it's gonna look like. And that's the same thing about quilting. I mean, we may have that vision, we may have that dream, but there's something about quilting that gives me the hope and strength to take a risk. I can cut that fabric apart. I don't know, well, I, I know, I have the vision. I have the vision, 
but I'm going to work with it until it comes, um, you know, it comes into shape. So persistence, that's an important part when you're talking about community change and transformation. You've got to be persistent. You can't make a quilt unless you're persistent. You True. can do something on a quilt every day. Well, if you don't do it. And the more complicated the project, the more persistent you must be. Same thing every day, you'll be doing it for decades. <laughs> yeah. So I think as a metaphor, it is really important. And I'm always looking for those intersections. I mean, I, sometimes like I pray for, you know, like for pray for wisdom or pray to God, you know, I pray to the, you know, the quilt and the quilting to give me a direction, give me the strength. And, um, you know, it, it works. <laughs> hmm. I'm so glad you brought up Obama um, because it feels to me that that first election really visually showed connections between African-Americans and various. Um, I have to look for a book. I'm, I'm here. I'm just behind the curtain. Hang on. Uh, textiles in the African continent. So um, in, in many countries, it's a practice when there is a, a, a big figure or big uh, social historical event to produce a piece of cloth that commemorates that event. And so you could see in South Africa and Kenya and Ghana, different pieces of Obama cloth with Obama's um, you know, face and different things. And then he and here mm -hmm. you could see so many Obama quilts in, the, in, in 2008, many years after. So it's a really it's a very nice visual kind of connection. Oh, and, and um, I have to I want to back up a little bit on the Obama piece because um, Roland Freeman, you all also were invited to participate in um, uh, no, not the mule train, the Obama quilts that he did at the DC Museum, and that was before um, the um, Hope's vision of the Hope book. Well, I, I also, since we're giving shout outs, I also want to give a shout out to Questa Benberry, who's yes. a, a phenomenal historian, particularly of African American American. We watched the video, remember? We watched the video and somebody who knew Cuesta um, said, because yeah, I usually speed up the videos. Like most of the videos we watch, I speed up a little bit. And the person said, she seems so sassy. <laughs> she seemed like extra sassy because she was like 1.25, you know, it's pretty funny. Anyway. Quilts and she died, I think, in 2007, and gave her archive and her research notes to Michigan State University. So people who in the future who want to study African American quilting can go to the kind of enormous kind of set of notes that she's uh, compiled over the years. And we were blessed to have Questa come to visit us. Um, Ow! She came to me and the we had an exhibit up. Sorry. And it was just an honor to know that, you know, we were able to just be in that sacred quilting space with her. So uh, the quilt guild has, ooh, not guild, excuse me, the quilt circle has <laughs> been very um, uh, fortunate to have had a lot of the uh, quilt mm. historians and the who's who in the quilting arena to come and visit us. And again, that community networks extends beyond North Carolina. Final thoughts. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm just for people who are just listening and not looking. Hang on. Carolina. Final thoughts on G's Ben, the modern quilt movement. Oh, and the future of quilting, hell yeah. Um, just like they say Columbus discovered America, even though there were people living here. <laughs> uh, about 20 years ago, the quilters of G's Ben were discovered. Oh, yes, girl. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm so here for it. Oh. There was an exhibit at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C., and the African American Quilt Circle went there to view that exhibit. It was like a religious experience. We saw it on a Sunday morning, too, and it was just, it was, sorry, sorry. It was a very moving thing. But what I want to share with you is the fact that those quilts were made by people to survive. Yeah. Now, they have the modern quilt movement. Woo! They use simple designs, basic shapes, oh. bright colors solids, lots of neutrals and, and white spaces and oh, open space. Yeah. And they're improvisational. <laughs> oh. the modern quilt Preach, girl! Movement. Modern? We've been doing it for years. Oh, okay. Tell it like it is, Margaret. God damn. Sorry, sorry. Oh, God, it's just nice to hear. It's just, ah. Oh. Quilting has had an impact on quilting. Sorry. Sorry, Period. sorry, Black sorry. Quilting. Sorry. Modern? We've been doing it for years. Black quilting has had an impact 
on quilting, period. I think all of the quilt movements have been inspired, stole, or whatever you want to call it, by what has come before them. And I think the modern quilt movement has done that. Mm. Uh, I think they have used the traditional blocks in a different, exciting way. But I think the, what I'm going to really uh, try to drill home is that the modern quilt movement is a moment in time, mm. and it has brought the idea of quilting to another age group that is reimagining what traditional quilts, Amish quilts, mm. Lee's Bend quilts, art quilts, improvisational quilts, all of that combined, they have been inspired by that, by those other mm. paths of quilting. And if you look at the, the, early, the oldest, the average age of a quilter today, according to these national quilt studies, is 62. Mm -hmm. That's okay. right. Now we can do the math. And if the average age is 62, mm. what, what does that say about the future of quilting in general? Mm -hmm. So if this movement, modern or not, if this movement is reimagining quilting for another generation, mm. that's a good thing. Because if not, the tradition of quilting is just going to eventually just die. God. So it has to be some energy that's put into the art form to bring new blood and new inspirations for new groups to pick up the banner. Well, AAQC's charge is to preserve the heritage of quilting in the African-American community by providing community outreach activities, supporting local and national humanitarian projects through quilting, and exhibiting locally and nationally to share quilting as an art form. Do we have a date on this video? We do. Hang on. I will find it. Blah. Sorry. Um, okay. These are amazing. They are so inspirational. Let's discuss. Yeah. I just totally jam out with everything they said. Oh my God. It's so good. Okay. So this was, um, it was on March 10th, 2018. Here's the, uh, here's the link. Throw it up in here. Um, it was it, and it was uploaded three years ago, so it was recorded on on the on 2018. So that's very interesting because I remember in Savannah in 2017, the modern quilt. I mean, I think actually actually 2018 was Pasadena got a lot of press. I remember the LA Times, which we talked about earlier today, right? It was it was in 2018 that 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 it was in the LA Times. I'm pretty sure. 20, yeah, no, 2018 was. Memphis, or, um, Nashville. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. sure, sure. Year before, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, yeah, good call, good call, totally. So, okay, so here, I mean, that was, that was so great. And, like, oh, man, like, what that woman said at the end is really true, um, that, like, that, my mom used to say this, the average age of the quilt maker was going up every year for a while. It was like 65, 66, and blah, blah, blah. And, and then, you know, around 2010 or something, you know, the modern quilt guild like began. And so that age started to come down a little bit. And, and the woman who spoke at the end was right. Uh, we have their names. I can get them. So, so I, I, I agree with her. I agree with her. But it was really good to hear that woman speak about, you know, the truth of it, which is that, you know, well, here, here, the best way I can put it, the cleanest way I can put it is this. At some point I realized, and it took me a minute, like I'm not gonna be like, I've always known, like that was some bullshit. It's been learning about this thing and understanding some things and unlearning a lot of things that I learned before to understand that when we talk about traditional quilts, traditional quilts are improvisational quilts. Traditional quilts are flying geese quilts. They are Mariner's Compass quilts. Traditional does not mean fancy. Traditional does not mean log cabin. Traditional means that something was done and then it was done again and again and again. And there are no race lines. There are no class lines to that. A log cabin quilt made to look one way and made to look another way or made in different styles. It doesn't matter. It's traditional. 
period, period, end of. Like, that's it. And what gets said a lot is like, oh, there's the modern quilt style and there's the traditional quilt style. But if the modern quilt makers stylistically are doing quilts in this particular style, they are drawing on traditional elements. They're not doing anything new. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, you're great. You're fabulous, but you're not doing anything new. And I think, I think to say it, to say it, there's no, there's no fight in that. It's just the truth. And it's exciting and it's fantastic that people are making quilts. But I mean, over the years, like, I mean, I just, I, I, it's a privilege to grow older because the older you get, the more you see it's always just one thing, right? And that's why I just, I don't want to die too soon because I just want to like keep learning stuff like that. But you know what I'm saying? Like traditional is quilts. Quilts are traditional. Like that's it. Like unless it, it, the art quilters were doing something kind of crazy. Once you start making quilts that go on the wall first and not on the bed, you know, it's it's it, that's that's a little bit new, right? That you're like, no, I'm gonna make a quilt that has that's purpose is not to be on a bed. And then there's a whole other discussion about that. But you know what I'm saying? Like if you're making a log cabin quilt, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care if you improved it. I don't care if you used a paper piecing pattern. I don't care if your grandmama taught you. It's traditional, right? You know what I'm saying? Quirk Quilt says, I like how she, hang on, I like how she nicely said, black women are tired of educating everyone and just to educate yourself and take what you will from the meaning of their quilts. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I, and I've heard, you know, uh, yes, drink wine and so Lynn. I'll be watching it again as I've been busy with the grants too. Hey, listen, it, it, that is that is a hell of a video. I loved it, I loved it. I'm so, so glad to find it. It's been a fabulous show, Sugar. Thank you, babe. Uh, I saw Christmas, where's Christmas? Hang on, I wanna see Christmas. Christmas, it's so good to see you. You're so cute, you just are. Everybody, everybody who comes to this show is cute. Um, Christmas says, what is a Murphy bed? What is a Murphy bed? A Murphy bed, Christmas, is when you have a bed it's what that's built is, into the wall. what if it's a Murphy bed. Oh, oh, what if it's a, okay. <laughs> it's like Chris, Chris. You never slept on a Murphy bed, Chris? Anyway, yeah, what if it's a Murphy bed? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. I don't know. What if what's a Murphy bed? The quilt? What are you talking about? What, what's happening? What if it's a Murphy bed? I don't know. I don't know, Chris, but if it's a Murphy bed, you know what? It doesn't matter. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Um, they were amazing, Wonky, totally. You're right. the, the, the video was filmed very well. Wasn't that good with the editing? Traditionally, traditional is culturally based, says Penny Catherine. Agreed. If it's a Murphy, just tuck it under the mattress. Well, I love it. Oh, I see. Okay. You know, you know what? There's actually, there's something there. Look at this. What is happening with my hair? Um, yeah, what if it's a Murphy bed? If it's a Murphy bed, it goes on the wall and the bed. Ah! Oh, that's good. I'm writing that down. I took a lot of notes tonight. Okay, in closing, you guys, we've gone over. We've gone over our usual allotment. Murphy bed. That's pretty clever. Murphy bed. Christmas, of course. You know, sometimes, see, that's why we like people who are outside the quilt world to come in and watch the show. They have different perspectives. Murphy bed. That's funny. It's very funny. So, so I grabbed this book, Flash of the Spirit, okay? African, Afri, African and Afro-American Art and Philosophy by Robert Ferris Thompson. That's a book I need to spend more time with. And then there's this one, which is very controversial, Signs and Symbols, African Images in African-American Quilts. Maud uh, Southall, Southall Woman? Southwell Woman. I mean, this person was fairly controversial. She said that there were, and I've actually heard Carolyn Maslumi say that she does not agree with this person's assessment that, you know, um, uh, motifs and patterns in African-American so-called quilts that came, you know, out of the South were sort of natural, like n sort of, um, they were a product of the, of the people sort of genetically because of where they came from, you know, from Africa. And she compares them to, you know, Yoruba cloth and, and different, uh, different things, you know, uh, what, is, what is some of the, I mean, yeah, she's, she's comparing things to, um, hey, Shannon, thanks for liking the stream. I'm so glad you came by. We're having a good time tonight. A really good time. Oh man, learning a bunch of stuff, enjoying ourselves and uh, getting a little fired up to be honest, which is great. Um, yeah, this is interesting. Okay, look, look, this will be coming up. And you know what? It's interesting. February is Black History Month. 
I'd like to think that, you know, we don't need like a month, you know, to just like talk about quilts and like the people who make them, which is like everyone in America. Um, but you know, but it, but it matters, right? It matters that there's like, you know, it matters that there's uh, memorials or, or, or occasions, right? You know, we, we take a day on Memorial Day to observe, right? So, so in February, let's observe. Let's observe the fact that we have special focus on on people who didn't always, you know, get into the history of this. And that's what I was that's what I was talking about with Bertha Mextra. Like I'm researching this fascinating woman. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. Well, this woman, you know, she was in the society pages because she went to Radcliffe. You know, so there's like articles in the paper about her that I can like follow and like I can find people who might have a Bertha Mextra quilt. Well, there's a lot of people who didn't make it into the society pages, right? And so the next person I investigate will be will be harder. Um, and so and so in February, you know, I'll put extra emphasis, right, on, on making content, creating content, um, finding content that, um, you know, let's observe, right? Anytime we can observe something intentionally, we're gonna do it, okay? <laughs> like, of course. So um, I, I love spending time with you. I think, Dee Marie, hello, hello. Um, and I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Miss Eleni, it is my pleasure. Uh, great night, Jill. Absolutely, with the favorite nerds. Um, I'm gonna go say hi to Eric and Stephanie Kate. Can we get a big round of applause for Stephanie Kate? Yeah, shucks, I didn't do nothing. She, yeah, oh, didn't do nothing? Incorrect, incorrect. Actually, here, disagree. Okay, take care everybody and uh, I'll see you on Saturday night and we'll have another good time. Actually, wait a minute, wait a minute. Nope, nope, I'm doing a shorty. I'm doing a shorty on Thursday. I'm doing a shorty on Thursday, 10 a.m. Quilts with words on them. It's a short episode. I'm gonna, gonna hook it up. It'll be fun. I'm gonna try to go 45 minutes. Just a quick episode about words on quilts. It'll be amazing, okay? Okay, take care everybody. Be good and, and be safe, okay? And remember, traditional quilts are American quilts. Yeah, period. Okay. Okay. Bye. <laughs>